Welcome to lecture 15 of our series on prosody. Here we'll get into some technical detail, but nothing really hard to understand. Pitch trackers are amazing things. They can take your spe speech signal and give you something clear and informative, even beautiful, sometimes even voluptuous, but don't be fooled. Real pitch contours are seldom like this. If you see something in a textbook like that, it's probably because a speaker with a great voice was used, carefully, carefully selected sentences were chosen, there were good recording conditions, and many, many takes. Probably your data is not like this. But pitch trackers can still give you a lot of information if used correctly. So a pitch tracker is an algorithm that takes a speech signal and outputs a sequence of pitch values every 10 milliseconds, sometimes every 20 milliseconds. You can download pitch trackers for speech and pitch trackers for music, which you probably don't want to use. As we've seen, music is acoustically very different from speech. It's also perceptually quite different. Another choice you may consider is using a neural pitch tracker. Uh, there are some that perform very well on whatever specific data set they're trained on, but that performance may not translate well to other data sets in different conditions or for different languages. And they also lack the parameters that you can use to tune them, their behavior so they work well for your specific data. So you'll mostly likely find one of these five. Pratt is incredibly convenient for quick looks at the pitch of short speech samples. Reaper is a standalone program that we found to be reliable even on noisy samples and even without much tuning of the parameters. And there's, there's other good choices. All perform well, decently well, especially in clean speech, and especially if you tune the parameters properly. So we'll talk about parameter tuning. To do that, we'll need to think about what's inside the black box of a pitch tracker. And there's three major pieces. The first one is generating candidate values. So looking in turn at each small piece of the speech signal, what are the likely pitch values for each piece? Uh, methods include glottal burst tracking, uh, autocorrelation, maybe use of LPC residuals, lots of techniques. Um, but you can never pin down exactly what the pitch is. You can just have some candidates with some probabilities assigned. The pitch tracker may not know if the pitch is 100 hertz, 200 hertz, 400 hertz, and so on. So the first par parameters we'll talk about are those to set the pitch range. Many pitch trackers by default look for a pitch in the range 50 to 500 hertz, which is enough to work for anyone, from small children to adult males. But this can cause problems. Here's a pitch tracker output. Uh, the speech was a normal speech input, but the pitch track is nonsense. You can see that, for example, at these points, the pitch track values are impossible. It's impossible for the vocal folds to reconfigure to suddenly jump the pitch up by an octave or down by an octave. The pitch tracker you know, maybe didn't know that. We need to tell it. If we tell the pitch tracker this is the range we want to look for, 130 hertz to 260 hertz or whatever it is, it will know not even to consider candidate pitch values outside that range. So those crazy values would simply not be a possible. And better yet, the pitch tracker will instead try to find pitch values within the range that you specified. And so this faint green line here shows what might happen if those impossible pitch values were recognized in the proper range. And now connecting the blue and the green, we find something that makes sense that we can interpret. So you'll need to set min F0 and max F0 appropriately. Another topic from lecture five was the question of microprosody. So looking at the pitch track for this little clip, it's something very odd right there. This is on the first S of source. So my perception of this disagrees with that of the pitch tracker. Let's see if you agree with me or the pitch tracker. Does it really sound like that sound is low there? All right, let's try that again. A good source of vitamins. All right, well, it's, it's true that human perceptions are very weak. It's hard to say what the pitch is just over a tiny, tiny fraction of a second. Uh, but to me, I don't have the sense that sound is low at that time. This is not something we could fix by changing the min F0. 
the value reported here is in a plausible range, but it's not realistic given the context. So we'd like to tell the, tell the pitch tracker, please pay more attention to the local context. Only give us values that are sort of smoothly connected to what's in the local context. So we can set a kind of smoothness constraint. A good source of vitamins. Oh, sorry about that. We can set a smoothness constraint to only select pitch candidates that are likely given the local context. Another option is to tell it to just ignore pitch candidates that have only weak support. In this example, probably on the S of source, there's some action, some wobbling or something going on with the vocal folds, but probably not strong periodicity. The pitch tracker knows these things. It can tell those things internally, and we can tell it. If there is low evidence, don't give me those points. In other words, we can increase the voicing threshold to require a lot of evidence before it even reports a pitch point. So two useful parameters. Both can help not only with microprosody, but also with those octaving errors. Uh, it can be risky to use those too much. It can distort the information that you're getting from your pitch tracker, um, which can be a problem. The last parameter to mention is the scale parameter, which determines whether the output is log hertz or equivalently semitones. You want semitones for, for sure if you're visualizing the contour, um, not least because that avoids exaggerating the importance of pitch peaks. But if you can do some subsequent processing, you'll probably just output a sequence of raw hertz values and then take the log in the next processing stage. So finally, most pitch processors will, pitch trackers will give you not only the hertz values, but two bonus outputs. And this is because F0 is not meaningful everywhere. Some frames are just unvoiced. Maybe there's no speech, or maybe it's an unvoiced consonant. In that case, there's no meaningful pitch value to report, so a pitch tracker might output a NAN, or just a zero to let you know that. Other pitch trackers might give you their best guess in any case. Right? Even if they're not sure, they'll just tell you what their best guess is, and they'll give you another column of information zero or one to indicate whether you should trust that. Others go further and actually give you a probability, a value between zero and one, indicating the probability of voicing. That information is valuable in itself. It can indicate phenomena such as devoicing or creaky voice. Okay, so pitch trackers give you a lot of control. So in that respect, they're kind of unusual. In other respects, they're like every other frame level feature detector. In that, the results that they give need further processing. So we'll see this in the next two lectures, how normalization and aggregation processes can give you eventually more meaningful mid-level pitch features or prosodic features in general.